Greetings, my faithful followers, the Green Scorpion here, with a spring-loaded countdown. One I've had coiled up for a while now. Back when the good old pandemic began, I returned to a game about people who can knock each other's lights out while still socially distancing. ARMS. This series and I had a really bizarre, rocky start. Even after adding five DLC characters, the overall package still felt a bit limp. However, the inclusion of Min Min to the Smash Brothers roster, coupled with my long-term and continued imprisonment in my own home, convinced me to bounce back into ARMS, and I'm really happy that I familiarized myself more with this wonderfully weird take on a fighting game. With a lean roster, but a full 3D environment to fight in, ARMS twists the punch, block, and grab mechanics of your average one-on-one -on -one bout into a surreal struggle of positioning, change-ups, and mind games. Oh, so many mind games. Taking on the ruthless AI opponents was a rewarding undertaking, forcing me to fully understand each limb-launching athlete's capabilities, weaknesses, strengths, and styles. So today, we're gonna rank them all down, from the second stringers to the best of the boxers. Similar to my Darkest Dungeon countdown last year, this countdown will be based on my own preferences, which character I like using the most, taking into account their stats, special abilities, default loadouts, and their designs and personalities. This certainly isn't a tier list, but if you've been thinking of giving this game a try, maybe it'll help you decide where to start looking for your main. So who reaches for the stars and who's a stretch too far? Let's bounce in and find out. These are my top 15 arms fighters. My first time playing ARMS was actually at a party. Comic Foil brought his copy over for us to try, so Patty and I had a practice match with no real clue on how to play the game yet. I think I picked Ninjara, after all it's hard to go wrong with a ninja, and Patty picked Helix, because out of the starting roster he looked the most interesting, with his wobbling around and making funny noises. After this singular match, Patty was so convinced that ARMS was a terribly controlled game that he never wanted to play it again. Well, it's really not the whole game's fault, Patty. That's just Helix. Oh, oh. Helix. Easily the most unique of the fighters in the roster, this wacky inflatable arm flailing tube man is not recommended for newcomers. Nor for longtime players either. In fact, I don't really recommend him for anyone. I think I see what the developers were going for here. Helix is this game's exemplary zoner, the kind of fighter that tries to keep enemies away by controlling the fighting space. Putting aside the fact that I usually hate zoners in fighting games, ARMS is a fighting game all about zoning, so how are they going to make this style stand out among the crowd? Well, with his gelatinous body, Helix is able to manipulate his hitbox in strange and unexpected ways. He can become tall and thin, or short and fat, and his attacks don't always come from where you expect them to. He can be a very confusing opponent when you're first learning the ropes. But to anyone who plays against Helix enough, and in a game with only 15 characters that's not hard to do, Helix's hitbox gimmick only requires the smallest adjustment in strategy. He's actually pretty slow once you understand his squash and stretch movements. And while he possesses the foundation for a peculiar strategy involving erratic movement and height advantage, his default arms do nothing to support this playstyle. So I guess I should explain this now since it's going to keep coming up. Every character has three default weapons, or arms, that you can equip in battle. There's a side mode where you can slowly unlock the ability for any character to use any arm, but I've always felt that their three chosen weapons are part of the character's identity. It's not the biggest factor, it just upsets me if they can't perform their intended strategies right out of the gate, and it's going to make me not want to play them in the first place to unlock these extra options. No one has this problem worse than Helix. All of his options are slow and unwieldy. The Blorbs have a difficult to control bouncing arc, the Guardians move at one mile an hour, I know it's a shield weapon, but still, and the Ice Dragon, the kind of weapon I actually like on other characters, just doesn't cut it for a character desperate for some straightforward attacking options. If you're going to make his movement weird, fine. If you're going to make his attacks loosey-goosey, okay. But both at the same time? And that's all he's got? Just makes every attack feel as inefficient as possible. Flubber should have stayed in the jar. So imagine you took the Houndmaster from Darkest Dungeon, added him into a fighting game, and made both him and his dog robots. What do you get? That's the central concept of Bite and Bark, and while it's an idea that I like a lot more than Helix, in execution it fared only a hair better. Honestly, I was hoping for something akin to Kiba and Akamaru from the Naruto games, man and canine working in tandem. But in practice, it's just so rigid and lifeless. 
Bark is entirely AI controlled, though once you understand his behavior patterns, you can use it to your advantage. Every 5 seconds or so, Bark will slobber up a fist at your opponent, and his bite, you can time your moves around this extra attack to keep combos going, ducking behind Bark for protection, or use Bark as a platform to gain some height. All neat little gimmicks, but at any time, your opponent can whack Bark with a newspaper and he'll be removed from the match for several seconds. Monstrous as it is to punch a dog, it's totally worth it, because Bite is a lot worse without his Bark. By himself, there's just nothing special about Bite whatsoever. He's pretty slow, his dashes are stiff, and his hitbox is a little taller than I would like it to be. Bark will get back up eventually, restoring your full combat capabilities, but the moments without him leave Bite as the least capable combatant in the entire game. His arms aren't even that exciting, though at least he can punch straight. <coughs> he likes <coughs> There are some treats that the pair can throw your way. For example, jumping off of Bark creates this quick little shockwave that protects both robots for a moment. Though, what comes up must come down, and if you don't take good advantage of that brief invulnerability, it'll be easy for your opponent to hit you on the descent. The best thing about this buddy cop duo, I suppose, is the mind games you can play with them. Wait a while, charge up your arms, let Bark play fetch with their face a bit, and when they think they're safe to throw Bark in the kennel, you launch your counteroffensive and take them to the pound. Feels kinda sick using your pet as bait like that, but hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. They say robots can learn to love, but Bite certainly hasn't. I'm not sure I trust him being a cop. Hey, bye. Master Mummy! The last character I'd say I kind of dislike playing. Master Mummy is like the Zangief of arms, big, intimidating, and focused on ultra-powerful grapples. And wouldn't you know it, I never really liked playing Geef either. But I can at least appreciate the balancing act that goes into using the Grim Creeper. His punches are strong, his throws are stronger, but his most notable quality is his bulk. Making up somewhat for the enormous girth, heavyweight characters like Master Mummy benefit from super armor while jumping, dashing, or punching meaning most attacks won't stop him and he'll only take 50% of the damage. This allows Master Mummy to easily bully opponents into a corner with no escape, or hit them with that 200 damage throw if they're blocking too much, which I imagine they are. Hyper -bomb! But if they're on the retreat and you don't feel like chasing them, there's another option to make them squirm. Recovery. Just hold up your block and Mummy will heal 10 points at a time, the only healing in the game that doesn't come from an item. So if you've already beaten the enemy within an inch of their life, maybe take it easy, rebandage yourself, and go for that timeout win. And when they realize what you're doing and rush in to stop you, that's when you can catch him with a surprise Megaton. Sure, he's slow, but when you can shake off attacks like he can, that's not really a problem. Again, not my style. There are heavyweights and defensive masters I much prefer. But if you choose your attacks deliberately, you won't be the only one covered in bandages. Now that we're getting to characters that I actually enjoy playing, it's fitting we move on to the most vanilla of them all, Springman. Now, I know that the creator of ARMS claims that every fighter is the main character of ARMS, but I think that's the sort of thing that you say when you're getting someone into Smash Brothers and Springman is busy being an assist trophy. Springman is the default, the Shoto, the guy new players can rely on to learn the game with. He comes equipped with everything you would need to take on a variety of opponents with his bread and butter strategy. That's not to say that there's no complexity at all to this toothpaste haired hero. For one thing, Springman is one of the few characters with the ability to parry. Releasing your block at just the right time will allow you to quickly deflect a punch and move right in with your punish. It's a tight window, but it's nice to see that the beginner's choice still has a benefit to mastering him once you've brushed up on the basics. On top of that, Colgate Pompadour Man benefits from a special perk when he falls below 25% health charging his arms for maximum damage and effect. Even his fundamental toasters can do a lot with that power, making for a good comeback mechanic. Not much else to say here, he's a jack of all trades and a master of none, but with enough little touches that can be squeezed out of him to keep him interesting. I'd prefer someone more specialized, but he is minty fresh. Gotta bounce! Now, if you're still in the market for a beginner's pick and the Crest brand cowlick doesn't suit you, why not give Ribbon Girl a try? 
she's every bit as easy to understand. And look, she's sucking Springman right in the jaw in the game's cover. She must be good, right? What Ribbon Girl lacks in power, she makes up for in maneuverability. Like, so much maneuverability. I've mentioned a few times already that it can be advantageous to attack from above. And unless you're on an inclined stage, this usually involves jumping. But the problem with that is that once you're in the air, your movement options are a bit limited. You can try and lean your way to a better position, or you can use your air dash to dodge a punch, but that's not a lot to work with. So what if you could jump a second time? Or a third time? Or a fourth time? That's Ribbon Girl for you. And if you don't like that, you can instead air dodge twice before touching the ground, or quick drop to the ground with the grace of a ballerina. Not that you'll be hitting all that hard, Ribbon Girl doesn't have any big damage weapons as her default. And even if she did, they would bog down her naturally zippy playstyle. But you can easily dodge around attacks and sneak in some quick damage if you're good enough. My biggest problem with Ribbon Girl is that she struggles to come back from a bad start. You can flit around poking your opponent for minutes at a time, but if they've gotten a few big shots on you and the clock is winding down, catching up can feel impossible. That's actually why I like using Ribbon Girl on lower level opponents, but then I usually switch to someone else when things heat up. And there are bigger hitters in the roster with just as much mobility if you're willing to learn the more complex characters. It's funny how much my opinions have changed since I did that Let's Play. I recall saying Springman and Ribbon Girl are my two mains. Things certainly have changed. In typical fighting game fashion, ARMS brings an evil doppelganger of the main character as a super hard challenge in arcade mode, and eventually the game was updated to make him playable. I'm having war flashbacks of Shadow Jago just looking at him. Springtron, as he's called, is the culmination of years of research and espionage into ARMS technology. And while as a boss he's a night unstoppable super being, in your hands he's just a slightly different Springman, but slightly different in distinctly interesting ways. He's still got the parry move of his organic counterpart, and while he loses the comeback mechanic and some aerial mobility, what do you expect, he weighs 500 pounds, Springtron makes up for it with a chargeable EMP blast. It's hard to land when your opponent knows what they're doing, but HOT DAMN IS IT SATISFYING! Disabling any of the enemy's arms that they happen to have extended in your range. It also comes with a bonus perk. After you use it, this little spark charges your own arms, so you can capitalize on a successful shockwave right away, which is one of my favorite maneuvers to pull off. I do wish he had some ice or wind weapons in his default kit to make this a little easier, but I guess that just gives me a reason to work with him more. Given the choice between a reliable Shoto and a nearly identical Shoto with a stupid way to style on people, yeah, I'm gonna try a style. You can call him a clone, but I call him a tradition. <laughs> My appreciation for Mechanica over time has been parabolic. The first time looking at her amongst the cast, I thought she looked pretty cool. Kind of a Tronbon thing going on, made me curious about how she plays. I also really like her backstory, despite its seeming simplicity. Mechanica works in her family's junkyard, and she's a big fan of the Arms League. Sadly, she wasn't born with the stretchy Armstrong powers of her idols, but greater fighters aren't born, they're forged. And so, Mechanica opted to build her way into the competition, without the financial backing of ARMS Labs or any major organizations. That's pretty cute. I look forward to meeting her and get- Oh no, get away from me! <laughs> Learning to play the game, I came to dread fighting Mechanica, as she has a tendency to either aggressively bully you, or get real dodgy and poke you to death. When it came time to actually use her in arcade mode, I was ready to hate her cheap tactics. But it turns out they're a lot of fun when they're working in your favor. The big gimmick with Mechanica's right armor is a combination of bulk and mobility. Like Master Mummy, she gets super armor while airborne or dashing, which includes 50% damage reduction. But while Mummy has more of a turtle up style, Mechanica is a very mobile tank with the help of her rocket thrusters, improving her ground dashes and giving her a hover. It's not the same level of aerial advantage as Ribbon Girl, but it gives her some wiggle in the sky. As Mechanica, you want to use these thrusters to harass your enemies from afar early on, then shift gears and box them in for the final assault. Much more interesting to me than Mummy's variant on the strategy. And while they wouldn't be my first picks, her default arms loadout gives her the versatility to pull it off. I'm not usually one for heavyweights, but Mechanica is in a class all her own. Oh. 
Why do I feel like people are gonna be mad at me for only putting Min Min at number eight? Do people get upset over arms? God, I hope not. Min Min happens to be most people's best girl in the series, and I can see why she has her Valiant Defenders. A ramen-themed martial artist is just the kind of over-the-top silly concept that I signed up for. And that design, that color palette! She's very cool. Totally makes sense as a Smash Brothers rep. Min Min is built off a fairly average foundation for a character, but with some amazing perks. She's pretty much the only fighter who thought to use her legs in a meaningful way. Sadly, you can't just roundhouse your opponent, but the kick acts as a small movement extender that, with proper timing, can block incoming attacks. The real meat and potatoes of her... Wait, ramen theme, um... The real pork and scallions of her playstyle is the dragon arm. Charging her arms a little longer than normal, Min Min's left arm goes all Jake Long and supercharges her weapon permanently, for as many punches as you got until she's knocked down or hit hard enough to go all limp noodle on you. This is the kind of charged pressure that most characters can only have for merely 5 seconds before it cools down, but good Min Min players can keep it hot and spicy for the majority of the match, and the fact that it's only on the left arm makes choosing her loadout a bit more of a calculated recipe. It only makes equipping new arms a lot more fun, since any weapon on that side basically will always be at max strength, but even her basic loadout gives her a lot to enjoy. One big and heavy, one quick and curvy, and a laser dragon for flavor. She's not my preferred cup of tea, but... Theming. She's not my preferred bowl of soup, but I'll use her to dish out some pain when I'm feeling a little spicy. Yeah. Nintendo closed out the DLC for this game by giving us one of the most unique characters in the roster. And unlike some earlier examples, <clears throat> she's unique in a way that actually makes her better. Dr. Coil, mastermind behind Springtron, Helix, Master Mummy, and all the technological advancements for ARMS Labs, she's pretty much this game's big bad unless you're counting Headlock. An evil genius with no time for anything but her work, this Rule 63 Dr. Wily projects the kind of arrogance I like to see in a villain. For example, even in her stats card, everything's in code. She wrote her height in binary. She puts herself above the slack-jawed competition, quite literally with the power of her special gimmick. She can goddamn fly! Or, to be more precise, Dr. Coil has no jump, but is floating at all times, and can use the jump button to increase her elevation. However, no matter what her Y-axis position is, she's always treated as if she's standing on the ground. This means that she can guard in the air, which is terrifying, mind you, and some weapons that would activate differently in the air instead get their grounded forms at all times, such as her signature Burchucks. In fact, all three of her defaults are a lot of fun and really capitalize on her gimmick. And that's not the only gimmick either. The same way Min Min can charge up for a beefier left arm, Coil can charge to get an additional appendage on one of her shoulders, copying the weapon on that side. Now she can send volleys in rapid succession, helping her turn the tides and harass with her vertical superiority. Her Earsot's ground state makes her extra susceptible to electric and ice-based effects, but if opponents don't know what they're doing, fighting Dr. Coil feels insurmountable. The game really knew how to end with a bang. It's a fighting game, guys. You gotta have at least one ninja. ninja Though I don't know if he needed a name as straightforward and on the nose as Ninjara. But hey, people have interesting names in this game. Let's just roll with it. Ninjara was a character that clicked with me immediately. Being quick and evasive, it's really easy to play him in my preferred rushdown strategy. Though at first I felt his design was a little too basic. Same thing I've said for Genji from Overwatch, I've seen more than enough ninjas in my day. You gotta do something to make it special. But after playing his arcade mode, I can see the small little extra hook with him. He's a student at a ninja college, and the game jokes about it by treating it like a really mundane thing. Literally, it's written in his backstory that this tournament is his senior project. It's stupidly silly, and I love it. And for arms take on a ninja, gotta say, going with chains was a really smart choice. So while I needed some time to truly appreciate the design aspect of this character, playing as Ninjara himself was immediately gratifying. It's all about the teleports. Whenever he air dashes, Ninjara disappears in a puff of smoke, making it harder to predict where he's headed next. And as much as I praise other characters for their air game, the problem with air dashes is that it can be really easy for an opponent to track and punish. Not the case with the Shinobi Valedictorian. You never know which way he's going to go until he's already gone. 
And another completely separate, albeit similar looking feature, is Ninjara's block. If he successfully defends himself, he'll use Substitution Jutsu again, preventing the chip damage that you normally get from blocking and allowing him to immediately counterattack. That is so unbelievably good, man! And it's not like the window to time it is any tighter than Min Min's Deflection Kick. It's just blocking, but better. Ninjara also gets the Tri-Blast by default, one of the best possible weapons for this zigzagging combat style. And the Chakrams just look seriously sick. Definitely completes the whole Fisher-Price Assassin fight he's got going. Do the impossible, see the invisible, rah rah, fight the power, dunk the ninja. <laughs> the commissioner of the Arms League and the original endgame boss at launch, Max Brass is a force to be reckoned with. On the surface, he might not seem worthy as the reigning champion, just a slower, bulkier springman. But at least he comes with really damaging grabs and Springman's trademark parry move. But let him charge up his attacks and you'll notice the difference pretty quickly. You won't like him when he's angry. Pumping up gives Max Brass fully powered weapons for the next few seconds, as well as super armor with even more coverage than Master Mummies or Mechanicas. Not to mention, when he goes beyond plus ultra, he gives off this shockwave that automatically blocks attacks for you. And that shockwave reprieve can really come in handy. And you know how Springman gets that permanent weapon charge when he drops below 25% health? Well, buckle in for some pain. At 25% health, Max Brass knuckles down and keeps his weapon charges and super armor for the remainder of the round. He is the definition of a comeback king. Your opponent thinks they have a commanding lead, but brother, the show ain't even started yet. I get the same feeling from Max Brass as I do playing Ganondorf in Smash Brothers. He can turn the tables at any moment with the right couple of punches. And what great punches they are. He has one of my favorite starting loadouts, including the Roasters and the Mother-Loving Nade. When it comes to fundamental fighters, Max is the total package. You mess with the brass, he hands you your ass. Kid Cobra! Am I the only one who finds Kid Cobra really weird? I mean, this dude was actually born with his elongated arm powers, and he decided to theme his identity, along with a RADICAL 90s ATTITUDE, around snakes, an animal notably bereft of limbs. Was this supposed to be ironic? Well, you do have all the other longer-than-wide objects represented in this game. Springs, ribbons, chains, freaking noodles. I guess there had to be a serpent character in there somewhere. A professional snake boarder, as he so insistently calls it, Kid Cobra has a unique movement style. At the start of the match, he's horribly slow on the ground due to a reduced dash length, and has the highest single jump of any character. So keep him in the air, right? Funny story, no. If you charge him up, Cobra gains the ability to chain two dashes together with zero delay. And if you keep charging, he keeps gaining more consecutive dashes. This turns Kid Cobra from seemingly the slowest character in the game into a groundmaster worthy of Little Mac. He's kind of like real life snakes. Those buggers always move faster than you think they're going to. There's a couple of little touches here and there that also support this gimmick. He has a great short hop that will help you avoid attacks and charge your weapons faster. And when making a charge dash punch, his weapons deploy as they would in the air. It's like reverse Dr. Coil and can lead to some seriously tricky mix-ups. He also rides low when he's dashing, letting him slither under most attacks, now that's pretty awesome. I admit I almost ranked Cobra this high for the cool factor, but if you watch professionals play as this guy, it's pretty ridiculous. He's not always fun against opponents that don't let you set up, and he has trouble regaining a lead if he gets rattled, but if you can get the upper hand early, Cobra will rip people to shreds. Don't really care for his stage though. Snakeboarding? Yeah, not a fan. Cobra. I broke my rule. I trusted the clown. And it actually paid off. Despite the initial horror Lola Pop caused the ARMS community at her first reveal, this merry minstrel quickly established herself in the metagame with her unorthodox but oddly useful movement kit. To steal a limerick from the greatest poem ever written, she has no style. 
she has no grapes. But this clown has a funny face. She can inflate herself just like a balloon and stretch her arms out just for you. This somewhat disturbing maneuver functions as her block, but unlike other characters, she can high jump or dash straight out of it. She can even inflate herself in mid-air before dropping into a bounce and reposition herself, all while retaining any weapon charge she's acquired. It's weird, it's wacky, but so good at keeping on the pressure, and she starts with two of the best weapons for this strategy, the Bifflers and the Funchucks, both of which cover a wide area and help you make your approach. I said before how much I love rushdown characters in fighting games, and how arms as a game kind of makes that difficult. If I want to rush down here, I need to either speed around in circles with Kid Cobra or Ninjara, or just super armor my way through attacks with Max Brass. But Lollipop is the closest thing to a rushdown character in this game that actually works for me. Her mix-up game is incredible, with sudden stops and starts to her movement, throwing off your enemy's groove by blocking attacks that they were so sure would work. It's like the Mechanica playstyle, but better, much more agile, and instead of super armor blocking 50% of the damage, what if I just block all of it? It's all about overwhelming your opponent with your massive amount of options, and using your oppressive weaponry to limit theirs, to the point where they're forced to make an obvious move you can punish. What a maniacal goofball. Well, only two fighters left, and they've got some big shoes to fill. If you remember back in my top 50 favorite video games of all time, I said Guacamelee felt like a game specifically made for me, partly because of how it played, and partly because of the Latin American themes. Well... This is also how I feel about my second favorite arm spider, Misango. First of all, just look at him, man. I love the Mayan theming, his outfit, the architecture of his stage, even down to his musical theme. I have a lot of family from South and Central America, so this kind of music is really nostalgic for me. And there's even a lot of neat little nods to ancient Brazilian civilization as well. For example, his name is a play off of misangas, which roughly translates from Portuguese into beads, but refers to these kinds of bracelets and jewelry made by braiding beads together. And looky here, that's exactly what the tethers of Misango's arms are made of! Neat! But on a mechanical level, Misango is possibly the most technical character in the game and it all has to do with that Aku Aku looking spirit floating next to him. He'll cycle between three different colors during the fight, and by holding your guard for a moment, you can have the spirit transform into a big pillar. It's a great way to hold your ground while your opponent is laying on the pressure. And that's just step one. Step two, by charging even longer or stepping into the pillar itself... Yep, like I said, Aku Aku. This mask gives you benefits based on what color it was when you deployed it. Sort of a cross between Twisted Fate's Card Roulette in League of Legends or Shulk's Monado art in Smash Brothers. You have to time what you need with the changing colors, but all three forms are pretty great if you can capitalize on them. You got the Blue Eagle Mask, which increases your ground and air mobility and allows you to do a super dash right after landing, at the expense of some girth and grab damage. And with the Red Bull Mask, you gain girth and grab damage, and effectively super armor at the expense of a little movement speed. And with the Yellow Lion Mask, your attacks charge the rush gauge faster, and you'll be immune to punches when activating rush attacks. So, if you want to evade and fight like Ribbon Girl or Ninjara, there's a mask for that. If you want to be a grapple bully like Master Mummy or Max Brass, there's a mask for that. And if you're going in for the kill or just want to scare the crap out of people with the threat of an invulnerable super, praise Chuck, there's a mask for that. Misango is so good, I honestly have trouble keeping up with him. I've had some of my best fights with him, but the skill ceiling is still so far out of my reach. I do wish his starting arms had a bit more curve to them, it would make the pillars in his stage a lot more useful if I could attack from behind them. But it's cool that all three of his default weapons have a poison attribute, which Misango introduced to the game in his update. And one of them, I kid you not, is a green freaking scorpion. Alright, arms players, I'm willing to share him, but Nintendo clearly made Misango just for me. And don't you forget it. Oichana! There's a big divide in this list between my top three and the rest of the roster, since each of the top three have something that is uniquely my favorite about them. When it comes to just how they play, Lollipop is probably my favorite. On the other hand, Misango is my favorite from a character and design standpoint. The DLC really knocked it out of the park. But for a combination of style and substance... Well... 
First impressions make a big difference. When I decided I would try to get good at arms, I gravitated pretty quickly towards Twintel as my main. And that wasn't a tough choice at all. I mean, look at her. I'm not gonna apologize for it either. Twintel's high. Almost made my top 10 crushes video I made a while ago. You don't need any quips for me to explain it. That's just how... Okay, one quip. Since you're gonna be looking at your character's backsides the whole time, at least Twintel gives you a view. Damn. Okay, moving on. Seeing as I was playing Twintel the most while learning the ins and outs of this game, I tend to think of every other character and their skills in relation to hers. Doubly so whenever a new DLC fighter is dropped. That's probably because Twintel's playstyle offers the best way for you to observe this game in motion. How do I explain this? Well, I was having trouble with arms for a while because of how much I love my rushdowns in fighting games. I already iterated that point several times by now. And while Lollipop helps me find a way to do that, that's not really what ARMS is all about. I had to stop looking at ARMS as a tournament fighter and start thinking of it as an arena fighter. It's got three dimensions of movement, oblong stages with gimmicks, items that spawn out of nowhere to completely change the standing of a match. I'd say it has more in common with Power Stones than Street Fighter or Killer Instinct. And in arena fighters, there's something I like even better than rushdowns, defensive opportunists. These are the types of characters that can set the pace of the battle, let the fight come to them, and then beat whoever brought the fight to them to a pulp. Characters like Neji from Ultimate Ninja Storm. Perhaps the closest comparison I can make is that mastering Twintel is like turning the game into Bayonetta. Perfectly timed dodges followed up by devastating counters. And because, you know, they both attack with their hair. Cinematic parallels. And they're both classy and hot. Shut up! Twintel even has her own version of Witch Time, her actress aura. With it, Twintel can slow all attacks around her, giving her more precious seconds to bob, weave, and wicked cleave. It's true that she's a little slower than my other favorites, but she'll slow the world around her to compensate. Then you got her general floatiness and double air dashes giving her great mid-air mobility, and a fierce arsenal of starter arms to boot. The Chilas can freeze your enemies while the Thunderbirds can electrocute them, adding to their sense of hopeless debilitation. And the Parasols also get high marks from me, a sturdy medium weight attack option that, despite there being better choices in the meta, just goes so well with her demure design that I usually keep them on anyway. What's the point of winning with Twintel if you're not gonna look good while doing it? All of this combines to make a character who is deceptively versatile, closing the distance while easily reacting to most attacks. Poking her from afar straight up doesn't work, and if she gets in close, she has some suffocating pressure. As great as the DLC characters are, arms couldn't improve on perfection. My second favorite design in the game, my second favorite moveset, add the parts together, and Twintel is my number one favorite fighter in arms. Smash Brothers, you can keep Min Min, as long as Twintel gets to be in the sequel. So, when are we gonna hear about ARMS 2, Nintendo? You're not fooling anyone, we know you're hiding it. Just add a few more features, work on a better netcode, for the love of God fix Helix. And for Twintel, don't change a thing. I'm the Green Scorpion, and I'll see you all next time. Also, ARMS 2 for EVO 2022, please.